This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, John Trudell, who has lived on Alcatraz Island since it was occupied more than two years ago by American Indians, will speak on Alcatraz, the meaning of the island. Mr. Trudell. Thank you. Uh, see, I guess today I'm supposed to speak on Alcatraz Island, the meaning. And like one thing that we've been called by the uh, United States government is uh, militants and radicals, you know, and we're not going to deny it, <laughs> you know. You know, he's beating around the bush about some of these things. But it's our definition and our interpretation of militancy and radical, radicalization that keeps us going. And I would like to read something, a very brief statement made by Black Elk. He was a Sioux holy man, and he went to Chicago and New York for the Wild West show in 1886 because he hoped to learn something. He hoped to learn some secret of the Washichu that would help my people somehow. I did not see anything to help my people. I could see that the Washichus did not care for each other the way our people did before the nation's hoop was broken. They would take everything from each other if they could, and so there were some who had more of everything than they could use, while crowds of people had nothing at all and maybe were starving. They had forgotten that the earth was their mother. This could not be better than the old ways of my people. There was a prisoner's house on an island where the big water came up to the town, and we saw that one day. Men pointed guns at the prisoners and made them move around like animals in a cage. This made me feel very sad because my people too were penned up in islands, and maybe that was the way the Washichu was going to treat them. And I think Black Elk said it. Black Elk knew he hit the nail right on top of the head because our people are put on these little islands now. We are pinned up. They're called reservations. And in the urban areas, they're called slums. And that's where our people are. And like we've had to listen now for 400 years to how the white man was going to make everything better for us. We've had to listen to, to the rhetoric. We've listened to the lies. We've watched our children be, be taken away from us. We've watched our land be taken away from us. We've watched our treaty rights being broken, hunting and fishing rights going. We watched the BIA, the government agency that was set up to protect us. We've watched this agency steal from us all the way down the line. They, st they steal our land and they steal our money. It's like in the film that was mentioned that, that this is the richest country in the world. And we Indian people, the people of the land, our average yearly income is $1,500 a year. This country that leads the world in and health and life expectancy. We, the people of the land, our life expectancy is 44 years. Infant deaths, we've got the highest rate of infant death of any, any group of people in this country. We've got the highest rate of unemployment of any people in this country. We've got the lowest level of education of any people in this country. And it was our country and we signed the peace treaties. We signed these treaties uh, so that we could survive. Our treaties said, give us education. All of our treaties said, give us education. Our tre treaties said that we had to have our lives taken care of. We had to have housing, that the government was to pay us for the land that was stolen from us. 
and the United States government signed these treaties, and they never once honored them. And we watched people in this country run around and talk about, about law and order, and about honor, and about freedom, and about democracy, and about brotherhood and love. We watched the government of this country go to, go to Asia because they've got a treaty to honor, they say. And yet we've got 389 treaties in this country that have been broken. And we know this country is not going to honor a treaty in Asia if they can't honor a treaty here. And we also know that we're no longer going to accept the lie about freedom. See, because freedom means that when you're free, you've got a right to decide what happens to you, that you've got a right to think, that you have got a say-so in your life, and we don't have it. We've got the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We've got a white government controlling us. See, because we can't buy the lie that's this whole theory that the white man came over here to make things better. Because the Indian problem, the so-called Indian problem of today is Indians are uneducated. We don't know the ways of the people. We have a high alcoholic rate, a high suicide rate. We live in, in poverty. See, we didn't have these problems before the white man came over here. Not a one of these problems did we have. We had a people whose every needs were taken care of. Do you know before the white man came over here that there was, nobody went hungry. If there was food, everybody ate. There were no rich and there were no poor. There were no prisons, there were no jails, there were no orphanages, there were no old age homes. There were no welfare programs. And there was no government sitting somewhere telling us that we all had to act and serve it. Because with our people, the people were the government, and the government served the people. And we've lived, we've lived the white way. We've had to live under the white way for the last 70 years, totally. And we haven't seen an improvement over our way. <clears throat> These freedoms, religion, our Indian people are told that we have got to accept the white man's religions. I'm going to explain it. the Alcatraz concept of God. God is white because everybody on Alcatraz, every Indian in this country, has been told that Jesus was white. We've been told <coughs> that Mary was white. And we've been told that God gave all the commandments to white people. You see, white people think God is white. And they're trying to make us think God is white. And the reason white people think God is white is because they created God over in their own image. And they did it right down to the last smallest detail, even to taking money. Because you go to church on Sundays and you gotta drop your money into the collection box. God doesn't want money. He's got no use for it. We look at your religions, like your, your organized religion has come to the point where it is business. It is big business now and it is nothing else. How rich is the Catholic Church? How rich is the Mormon Church? And they're sitting on top of all this money while all the Catholic Indians in this country are living on $400 a year and starchy foods that the BIA gives them to eat. And even more important than that is when the first Europeans came over to this country, when the first white man came over here, he came over here in the name of the Queen of Spain and the Catholic Church. Britain sent their people over here in the name of the British government and whatever church had power there. The Dutch did it, the Germans did it, the French did it, the, everybody did it in the name of their government and their church. And they came over here and they called us heathens, they called us savages. In the name of God, they killed us. 
In the name of God, they took our land. And if you can do that in the name of God, that means God, that the white man's God does not respect the Indian. There is no room for the Indian in the white man's God. Our young children that go to the missionary schools now, the missionary schools where the Catholics get a few and the Protestants get a few and the Episcopalians get a few, everybody gets their share of the youth. It's almost as though we're making an offering, a forced offering. But these kids go to this, these religious schools and picture, I want you to picture a small child being beaten for wetting the bed. I want you to picture an Indian child being told, turn the other cheek. Keep on turning the other cheek because when you die there's a reward for you in heaven. So as long as we, as long as we, we, we are led to believe in the white God, we're no good to our people. As long as we're led to hang all of our hopes and beliefs in the white God, we don't believe in our people. And our people are more important than any white God that hangs from the sky that there is. See, because we have God. We lived with God. We didn't have to spend three million dollars to build a temple to go in and pray to him. We did not have to get on our knees and look at the floor and pray to God. We walked out into nature and we looked at the sun and we looked at our surrounding and prayed to God. We lived with God. We respected the environment because if God isn't around us, he isn't. So when, so when white society comes and starts telling us about God, we know, we know the difference. education. The Bureau of Indian Affairs educational policy that is administrated by the mission schools and by the Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding schools. This education policy was set up in, in 1874 and it was set up to break down the Indian nations break the Indian people so that they would no longer be a threat to the white United States of America. And the plan was break the nation down, break the tribe down, break the family down, destroy the language, destroy the religion, and then the Indian, who will the Indian be? And that's where the first school came in, the first school for Indian education came into existence under those conditions. There are documented cases of Indians in the Southwest having their treaty rations withheld from them until they sent their children to these schools. And the strange thing about a Bureau of Indian Affairs school is that it's built away from the people it is to serve. And we want to know why our young have got to travel 500 to 1,000 miles to go live in a prison that is called a school. We want to know why our children have got to go to these schools and sign out when they go to eat supper and sign back in when they get back. We want to know why our children can only go downtown one day and one, one afternoon a week and that's if they're good. And we want to know why our children when they go to these schools, why they can't go home if they don't like it. Do you know that if you go to a bureau school, a boarding school, and you don't like the school, you can only drink your way out or go up and drop one of the faculty? And I've seen both ways done. Because see, if you run away from the school, the state police always bring you back. Because these Indian schools sit in the middle of white communities somewhere. You can always spot an Indian on the run. And for every hour that you're gone from the school, you're listed as being AWOL. And so for every hour that you're AWOL, you've got to work two hours extra duty. And you're restricted 
until that extra duty's worked. Vocation is stressed. Vocational training is stressed in these schools for, for the Indian youth. The idea is being pumped into Indian heads, get, get a high school diploma, and they go to a, a junior college, a vocational training school, so you can get a good job when you get out. But why? Why should we go learn a trade? We go learn a trade, we go learn to be auto mechanics, barbers, dental assistants, bakers, and we get out, Indian people don't own these things, so we gotta go work for a white man, we gotta go work for his two dollars an hour, and try to be like him, and he makes $25,000 a year profit, his company does, and we're barely making enough to live on. And again, with the young. Do you know how many young children, how many young reservation children, <coughs> that when they're raised, before they have white contact, they're raised, with their, they're raised in, their, in their tribal ways. They can speak their tongue. They know the religion. They are taught that to survive, that the Indian way of survival, the Indian way of life, is sharing, it's cooperating. It's not, co not competition. And these young kids go to school, and they get to school, and then they're told, they're told by, by their teachers and everyone else that hangs around these schools, well, you can't talk Indian, you gotta talk English. And here, here's a good Christian faith for you. Save your soul. So they're telling these kids, that their language and their religion, that their people are wrong. And then these kids sit down to take a spelling test or an arithmetic test. <clears throat> and they lean over there to do some of that sharing of information and zap, cheating. You don't cheat in education. I don't see how it's possible. And by doing that, they tell these kids, your parents are wrong. Your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your medicine man, everybody you've ever associated with before you came to talk to me, the white man, everything is wrong. And American history, wow. Indian kids go to school, and they gotta learn about who George Washington was. They gotta learn about who Thomas Jefferson was, who Benjamin Franklin was, who Abraham Lincoln was, George Custer, John Kennedy. We gotta learn about the Constitution, about the Bill of Rights. And we're all told that the white man did all of this. See, but they don't tell these Indian young that, that the Bill of Rights or the U.S. Constitution was taken from the Iroquois League of Nations, that it was taken from the Iroquois way of life the legislative branch, the judiciary branch, and the executive branch, all patterned after the Iroquois government. Instead, the Indian kids are told, well, look, Benjamin Franklin wrote this down, and Thomas Jefferson added some more to it, and then John Hancock signed it. Nothing about Indians. Instead, we're told, well, the Indians waged war on the pilgrims. Uh, they killed women and children. They burned settlements. And in general, they just stood in the way because they were obnoxious. And they were like this because they didn't have any, any learning. They didn't have any religion. The history books say nothing, not one damn thing, about smallpox blankets being distributed to, to whole tribes, whole tribes disappearing because of smallpox blankets. The history books say nothing about the colonies issuing bounty on Indian hair. It's kind of like killing a coyote. You bring back the ears, you prove he's dead. And they knew the only way they were gonna get an Indian's hair was to kill him. And the bounty went, you got more for a woman and a child than you did for a man. 
Instead, the history book turns around and says, Indian scalped people. You know, and maybe we did, but we didn't do it for money. There was no, no, no greed in it at all for us. And while our children are supposed to know who all these white people are, how many of our Indian children know who Osceola was, who Tecumseh was, or Handsome Lake, Looking Glass, Captain Jack? Our Indian, our Indian young, very few know, know much about these people. And these are Indians. These are the people that fought and died so that the Indian people of today wouldn't have to be lorded over by the white man. And the United States government sits back, and the American public, they sit back and they say, there sure is a problem. We can't educate these Indians. Indian people don't sit in on school boards. I mean, there's a few isolated cases here and there. But Indian people don't decide the curriculum. Indian people don't decide where the money's going to go, how it's going to be spent. Instead, white people sit there. They sit back there and they decide what we're going to get. This big Johnson O'Malley Fund thing. Between 1967 and 1970, $33 million was taken from Indian people. Half of the allotment for Indian education was swiped. It was just completely stolen, and it was stolen by whites. $33 million in, in three years. The Johnson O'Malley Fund Act has been lost since 1934. If they got 33 million in three years, how much did they get before? If they did it in education, how about housing? How about health? It was all ripped off. And this is why Alcatraz has to exist. See, because Alcatraz, the island, is in San Francisco. But Alcatraz, the movement, is wherever Indian people live. Alcatraz, the movement, can be where white people live, too, but that's up to them. See, because a funny thing is like, well, it isn't funny. It's like a lot of white people are going around saying today, uh, right on to you Indians, you know, you really been screwed. You know, we're behind you. You know, we support you. And then one day we got, <clears throat> the anti-war movement came out to Alcatraz, you know. And they came out there and they told us, uh, statistically, more Indians are dying in Vietnam than should be. <laughs> so why don't you come over to the anti-war rally with us and help us protest against the war so we can stop it and then your people won't have to be dying over there. You know, we've got to think about things like, uh, yeah, more Indians are dying in Vietnam than should be. If one Indian dies over there, that's more than should be. But see, there are more Indians dying in this country than should be. We got another war right here. And all of a sudden, these, the young white affluent, they come over to us and they say, come and help us end this war. Well, our war has been going on for over 400 years. And we, we've known it and we've been trying to tell about it for over 400 years. The Young Whites War has been going on, this war, the war that they recognize, has been going on for about 10 years. And the war in Vietnam is the American system, the American society, the United States system. It's not the American. America is the land. The United States is the government. But see, it's not a patriotic war. The young people don't believe in going over there and fighting and dying because they say it's immoral. 
They say all war is immoral. Well, if the war in Vietnam is immoral, the war Indian people are, are trying to survive through in this country is immoral. And see, we got to think about our land is being taken. The, the Nisqually people in Washington have got a treaty with the United States government saying that they can fish for salmon with nets forever. The state of Washington is arresting these people. They're destroying their nets and their boats because the, these Indian people are going to wipe out the salmon industry, kill off all the salmon. That's what the state of Washington says. They, they, they ignore the fact that there's only about 10 families doing the fishing. You know, and like on the coast, this, this is information, this is news. People know about it on the coast. And yet all these young white people that are so damn concerned about the war in Vietnam, we don't see them out there supporting those Indian people in Washington. We don't see them getting up there and saying, stop beating these people in Washington, stop denying these people in Washington their rights. Instead, they're coming to us and saying, come on over here and help us protest the war in Vietnam. You see, well, we're not gonna help anybody unless the help is, is given and taken equally. Because we want to know after the war in Vietnam ends, are all these young anti-war people going to come over and help us end our war? Or are we going to be used again? Women's Liberation came out to Alcatraz in January last year. We let them on, nobody hassled, nothing like this, but the first thing those fools said was, they told our women, you're doubly oppressed. Your men are oppressing you and the system is oppressing you. Come and help us fight for women's liberation. Our women couldn't even understand them. Couldn't even hear them. And white women's liberation couldn't understand that. But you see like, see like, in, we, we can get behind daycare centers, And we can get behind, if, if people want to have abortions, whatever they want to do, that's up to them. We know the white woman's been oppressed. Because Indians have always been talking about the white man. We never said anything about the white woman. It's always been the white man. We've always known. See, because women's liberation, they got a lot of a validity behind what they're doing. But see, we look back and we see so many of these women going out and saying, equal pay for equal jobs. All right, number one, there's a potential threat for my eating tomorrow. And if, if these women think they're going to get equality with the men through money, then they're wrong. And also, we want to know why they want to be equal to the men. We haven't figured that one out. But see, we don't want them coming to where we're at and, and trying to divide our women, divide our people so that they can fight their fight. 200 million people in this country are white. At least 100 million of them are women. And they'll come to Alcatraz where we are fighting our fight right now and try and recruit our women to come and help them. But I would like to see them go knock on every door in Ames, Iowa and tell all these white middle class women, hey, you're oppressed. I would like to see them do it in Lincoln, Nebraska, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I want to see them do it where the white women live. Go get the white women to fight that battle because right now it's a white woman's fight. And they wouldn't be using us. See, we're very... We don't trust a lot of people anymore. See, because back during the time everything was being openly out and out ripped off and everybody was getting in, getting in on the act. 
We remember all the liberals back on the East saying, poor Indians, give them some land, treat them nice. But while they were saying that, they were allowing the government and the system to come in and rip us off. And they do it, the society works in very strange ways. It has to justify everything that it does. And then no matter how immoral it is, if they can justify it, then they can sleep at night. They can close their eyes and not have to worry. Like a hundred years ago, it was illegal to sell Indian people guns. You know, it was the law. And a hundred years ago, the Monroe Doctrine was in, in effect. The Monroe Doctrine said that no outside nations could come into this hemisphere. And a hundred years ago, the Plains Indians had land that, this, that the white Americans wanted. We had a lot of land that they wanted because there was gold on our land. And see, our land was guaranteed that no white people would come on our land, none whatsoever. And they put up these army posts along our land, along the borders of our land, to make sure this was enforced. But you know, it's strange how the trappers got in, uh, the immigrants going through Oregon, they got to go through. Pretty soon the buffalo hunters came in. And with all these people, all these white people coming into our land, there were a few gun runners. There were always gun runners. And these gun runners had to be from the United States. And they would come into our land and they would come to us and they would sell us guns. And they would sell us ammunition to go with the guns. But a strange thing is they never sold us enough ammunition. Not once did they sell us enough ammunition. They did not give us a supply. They just gave us a little bit, see, enough so that we could start fighting with it, but not enough to carry out the fight. And then after our buffalo were being ripped off and we got tired of having our women raped and our, our, our animals stolen from us and our people shot down with no justice about it, Indians went on the war path. And as soon as they picked up those rifles, bam, here goes the United States Congress declares war on the Indians. The army goes in, everybody starts shooting Indians, everybody starts killing our women and our children, burning our, our lodges and our, our villages down to the ground. And then to survive, we have to sign a peace treaty. And there went our land. And all of America was pacified. They were it was all rationalized while the Indians went on the war path. See, and these things happened. And then like today, to hear, you know, everyone wants to know what's wrong with the country today. They want to know about uh, law and order and injustice and all of these things. I just had a political campaign here not too long ago, I guess. I guess that's what it was. I, I thought it was a bargain thing, you know, whoever could sell the most got it. But to see a politician stand up and say that this is a country of majority rule almost physically makes me sick to my stomach. To hear someone stand up there and say majority rule, that's the concept of freedom and democracy and everything we've got going for us that's glorious here. First thing about that is, in this country of majority rule, 200 million people are white. And no matter how you break that down into Republicans, Democrats, or peace and freedom, frisbee throwers, I don't care what kind of party they are, they're still white and they still control and rule. See, so that's not going to be the solution. See, because the Indian has no say-so in what happens to him. The black man has no say-so in what happens to him. Chicano has no say-so in what happens to him. Not even a token say-so. 
And that's the problem with white America. Enough of them have a token say-so, so that they think that they've really got a, say, got a say in what's going to happen. And when these people stand up and say, the only way you're going to bring about effective change is to work through the system, I'll tell you something about the system. I was listening to the news this morning, and they said that uh, Newark, New Jersey, is bankrupt. It's broke. They've got racial problems. They've got the highest rate of VD of any city in the country. They've got the highest infant death rate of any city in the country. And the strange thing is the mayor of Newark is black. And by saying you can make it through the political system, a few blacks make it here and there. There are, there are four or five black mayors now. And we got a few Indian garbage collectors making it through the system. See, but like, when I look at that, it's like the ghettos, you know, where the black people live now. White people lived in those ghettos one time, and they still own them. But as the white man made things better for him, he moved out of the ghetto and he moved uptown. And then in come the blacks and the Puerto Ricans and whoever lives in the ghettos now. See, and the white man lived uptown while the, all the goodies were uptown. And now that the cities are becoming an administrative hassle, they have racial problems. They, they don't have enough money for the cities. They don't have enough anything for the cities anymore. So now they're electing black people to run the cities while the white people move to the suburbs and can avoid it. Don't have to live with that problem anymore. And then how many black people believe now? Well, look where we're getting. Just getting another ghetto. Getting a ghetto with taller buildings. Getting a ghetto that's got some industries in it that they don't own. See, and that's what we don't want. Anything that happens to Indian people, we want to control it. We've got a Bureau of Indian Affairs that's set up to take care of us, and money has been appropriated by Congress. Every year there's money grinded out to give to us, and we never get it. But well, we want control of that money. We want control so we can start building our own schools, our own hospitals, developing our own economic base, so we can be free. And that's what we're going to fight for. You see, because welfare is welfare. I don't, I don't care if they send you $100 a month from the local welfare office or if they come out and give you a $200,000 OEO grant that they control. It's still welfare. And the Indian is not going to live on the white man's welfare any longer because we know the white man's not going to respect us and we're not going to respect him. And we want control of some, we want, not control, but we want to see the laws changed. You know, it's like, <clears throat> the law in this country is so sickening. It, it, it's, it's sickening that people will sit back and accept, just sit back and accept this, this law system. See, because there are five kinds of law. There's common law, statute law, criminal law, another one, constitutional law and treaty law. All right, five kinds of law. This is a country of law and order. Matter of fact, a man from Vice President Agnew's office told us that last April, that this is a nation of laws and we got to obey the law. Well, if this is a nation of laws, then how come our treaties weren't honored? If they're not going to honor the treaty law that the Indians signed with the white man, then how come they're going to honor the law that says that you've got to arrest an Indian when he gets drunk? How come they're going to honor the law that says you can come and take an, take an Indian's refrigerator away from him if he doesn't have enough money to pay for it? The Constitution says all the laws are equal for everyone. 
And see, because this is leading into an area like drugs, it's always been illegal. Heroin has always been illegal. And heroin hasn't been an Indian problem. See, because up to this point, Indians have been on reservations. See, alcohol was it. You know, like it was illegal to sell alcohol to Indians up until 1954 by federal law, but we always had it. But now, now, now they're taking our Indian Removal. See, they've got a new Indian Removal Act, but they call it something else, further advancement or something. But they're taking Indian people from the, from the reservations and putting them in the cities. And when they put these Indian people in the cities, they're not prepared to live in the city. And many of these people wouldn't even, they wouldn't go to the city, except that they think there's, that they're gonna, they have a better chance for survival there. They get enough Indian people in the cities, get enough Indian people living in poverty, and then start pumping that, pumping that hard dope out there to them. And there's a good chance it could become an Indian problem. And the strange thing about heroin is like it's always been illegal and it's always run rampant in the black communities. And so this society in waging its war on drugs because drugs create high crime, you know, and so they gotta have all this, these things protect. They'll go into a, in a black community and they'll arrest a black man for selling heroin to another black man and when they arrest this black man, they're going to say, you got a right to call your lawyer, and anything you say can be used against you, and we're telling you all these things because the Constitution says we got to protect your constitutional rights. And so while everybody's hung up in protecting that black man's constitutional rights, rights that don't mean anything because he's going to be tried by a white jury in a white system, the man that's bringing the heroin into the country, the man that wears the business suit and sits in an office is going scot-free because they gotta protect his constitutional rights too. And every once in a while you can open up the newspaper and read the newspaper and in the paper it gives you the name of the top 10 people that are bringing dope into this country. And with all this country's emphasis and love for law and order, I wanna know why they can't break the mafia, why they can't break organized crime. They take some of those police off the streets and stop them from harassing the man that lives in the, that is a product of his environment and put them to work on getting the real troublemakers out of here. Then that's law and order. See, but even the law and order thing in this country is a lie. Because this country was built on a lie. This society was built on the biggest lie that was ever created. It was built so that a few in the white race could control everybody. In the beginning, it started to be a few people. But now it's your corporate industries, your Bank of Americas, and your Dow Chemicals, and your United States Army. You see, we know, Indians know, because we've had, we've had it all down on us. We've, we've fought your army, we've fought your We've had to, to live and fight with your, your liberals and your conservatives, with your education programs, with your laws, with your medical programs. We've lived with all of it. And we're lucky to still be living. And we've lived, lived with the neglect. and copping out. You know, one time, a couple of times, I had people say that they weren't gonna listen to me because I was a racist. And I wanna know how I can possibly be one. How can an Indian be a racist? How can any group of Indians be racist? How can blacks be racist? How can Chicanos be racist? We can be angry, but we, we, we're not qualified to be racist. Because what do we control? Whose lives do we control? Who are we oppressing? Who are we using? Who are we stealing from? 
racism is created when, one's, when one race of people controls the economics and the, then it could create racism to separate the other people. And it just, racism happens to be between whites and non-whites. See, there's such a thing as truth. And you can avoid the truth by labeling it as racism. You can avoid the truth by labeling it as radicalization. You can avoid the truth by labeling it as militancy. But the truth still stays there. And see, all these things that have been mentioned, Indians have lived with them. We've lived with it ever since white people came. The blacks have lived with it ever since they've been ripped off their land base in Africa and brought here. The Chicanos have lived with it. And we're tired of it. It's like, See, God, the real God, he didn't make Indians to be workers for white people. He didn't do it. He didn't create mankind so one, one group of people could be enslaved by another. And so like, like on the island, they call us militants and they call us radicals, not once. Have we ever stepped up and said, we're going to buy every gun we can get our hand on and shoot every one of you down? Never even talked about that. See, being a militant or being a radical in this country is when you disagree with the United States government and you're not willing to sell yourself out by compromising. See, we Indian people have learned, we've had to learn the hard way about compromise because every time we signed a treaty, every time we have ever dealt with the United States government, in the past, we were always right, because we were never saying, give us something that didn't belong to us. And when we were right, we compromised. And look what has happened. See, to us, being militant means that we love our people. And we can no longer sit by and watch this system steal from us and exploit us. Because when we think about Indian health, we think about the 44-year lifespan, and then go, go turn on the TV or go open the newspaper and read about this heart transplant that gives another white man another year to live. Think of the money that was spent to develop heart transplants. How many Indian lives could have been saved with that money? And if the heart transplant is ever perfected, how many Indians are going to be able to afford it? Not any. Sometimes I almost feel like a guinea pig. And as far as being radical, we know the truth because we've lived it. And with Alcatraz, we're not going to sell out. We're not going to compromise. We want the deed to that island because we've got it under a treaty law. And the only way the United States government is going to get that island back is to come out there and take it away from us. Because it's our island now. They can take our water away. They can take our power away. And we'll haul the water. And we'll use candles and kerosene lamps without the power. We'll haul wood. We'll do all the things that most of us have been doing all of our lives on the reservation. We'll do it out there, too. We've had perfect training for the Alcatraz occupation. We grew up as Indians in America. So it's not a hardship. I want to close this with, I was in, in Minneapolis in the American Indian Movement office. And a 12-year-old girl wrote this, 12-year-old Indian girl. Says, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Matthew 25, verse 37. We were hungry, and you circled the moon. We were hungry, and you told us to wait. 
We were hungry and you set up a commission. We were hungry and you talked about bootstraps. We were hungry and you had napalm bills to pay. We were hungry and you said we have a war to end. We were hungry and you said submit a proposal. We were hungry and you said the poor will always be with us. We were hungry and you said law and order come first. We were hungry and you blamed it on the communist. We were hungry and you said women's lib is angry. We were hungry and you said God helps those. We were hungry and you said we're doing the best we can. We are still hungry. Thank you. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, John Trudell, who has lived on Alcatraz Island since it was occupied more than two years ago by American Indians, spoke on Alcatraz, the meaning of the island. This was the last in a series of programs recorded at Iowa State University's National Affairs Institute devoted to the American Indian. University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.